And now if Mark Moody Stewart would come forward and Lee Tavis and I will join him. When, when Ollie invited me to, to come here, right, I thought about what I was going to say and then I left the page blank because I thought there would be so many interesting things said, one needed to, to try and build on them in, in some way. Uh, so this may be a bit disjointed. Uh, I think if you start with the, as we did on uh, Sunday evening with Carolyn, Dean Carolyn Wu's speech uh, about an ethics-based business school. And that was, one realized that the business school here, the, the uh, school has created a framework, an ethos, and I think that's very important for the students here because in any company you go, there will be an ethos. It may be a good one or a bad one, uh, but uh, it, how you create an ethos, I think, is, should be part of the study of a, of a business school. Dean Arvid Johnson said uh, that how you did something, what you actually, how you do it is probably more important than, than uh, what you do. And I would only say that it's been an enormous pleasure to be here. I was here five years ago. And it's a bit like uh, when you're digging in a field and you take a break and you go off and rest under a, a tree for a while and there's a cool breeze and you can have a drink of water and maybe there's some like-minded people there. Uh, and then you can plan what you're going to do when you get back in the field and start digging again. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity for you students to be able to do that, to plan what you're going to do afterwards. And as you choose what company you're going to uh, work for and uh, use your talents in, uh, I think you have to ask yourself, how does that company and what it does, how do its values align? And uh, we just heard, if you work in a global company, I think it's, uh, it is possible to have for a global corporation to have values which are acceptable in Japan, in China, uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, the United States and so on. It's not easy, but what you need to do is build a system where people buy into those values and can say through exchange of war stories and so on that we do, they can talk about the corporation as we do this or we do not do that and they can say it with the uh, reasonable com uh, confidence. No company is, is perfect, but uh, since we're not perfect either, that's uh, not so bad. Uh, when I joined Shell, I wondered seriously how I could contribute to what I regarded as an enormous and highly efficient organization. I'm happy to say that in the nearly 40 years I was involved with them, uh, there was never a day, I think, that I didn't see something that needed doing and that positively irritated me or got me angry. But equally, one always felt that, that if one spoke about something, people wouldn't just say, get back to your job, boy. Uh, they would listen to you. And you could have a discussion and wrestle with some of these uh, difficult problems. And that, I think, is extremely important. Uh, York uh, Lunau of, of Novartis showed us a table one of these matrices, performance matrices, with uh, performance, financial performance, and so on, and whether you were operating in line with the values. And you could have people with uh, superior results, uh, but poor uh, behavior. And uh, if uh, he suggested that you shouldn't pay him a bonus, I think you'd actually, over time, take rather more drastic action than that. If you have somebody who works in the company who achieves outstanding results but does so by beating up all his uh, or her people uh, and is a thorough bully. If you don't, if you're, one of your values is respect for people and you don't either cause that person to change their behavior or cause them to leave the company, you might just as well rip up your values and throw them away. Uh, the last point I'll make generally for students is, is the point that Cecily Joseph of Symantec made, which is about jobs in sustainability, uh, and that there are very few. I get lots of people come to me and ask me, how can I get a, build a career in sustainability? And my answer would be the same as Cecily's. Go into the line and apply sustainability there, 
when you have some experience, maybe you'll want to stay there because it's a very exciting place to be. Uh, Cecily called it being an undercover agent. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it should be quite so undercover, but anyway, it should be an agent uh, integrating it into the day-to-day -day job. Right, now back to the, the Global Compact. I think one of the geniuses of uh, Kofi Annan when he made his speech in 99, I think, in Davos, uh, was to not just concentrate on business, but to include civil society and labor organizations. That this should be a business-led organization, but that it should include other sections of society as inherent members of the organization. And Bishop Kevin Dowling, uh, I think, recognized that and, and is clearly a very strong supporter of that and is clear that we need cooperation between sectors. We're never going to achieve the sort of things that we've been talking about by business on its own operating. It has to operate with other parts of, of uh, society. And I think that's one of the most encouraging things in... Uh, I'm actually an optimist. Most geologists are optimistic because we've seen things over the millennia and uh, eons come and go, and uh, we're not too worried by it. In fact, we rather enjoy it. Uh, the, uh, my wife always says when people say save the planet, she says it's not about the planet. It's just whether humans will survive. The planet will be just fine. Uh, the uh, uh, most positive development, I think, is the capacity of different parts of society to work together, which has happened in the last uh, 10, maybe 15 years, where you see individuals where individual issues, very often single issues, could be the, the nature of a product, timber products, uh, sustainable fisheries, sustainable forestry, where leading companies, businesses, sometimes labor unions, sometimes governments have got together and created a new norm in that area. And it's extremely powerful, and then these new norms are built into things like the equator principles, which is another of these issues, uh, things like the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative or the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. These are all things, none of them perfect, the Kimberley process, none of them perfect, but which have made real changes in the last 10 years or so uh, and progress things in one area. And I think that's very important and that's what we have to do and I'll come back to it in the context of, of local networks. Uh, Kevin McKnight of uh, Alcoa said he was the only miner present. It's not quite true. After Shell, I spent seven years as the chairman of Anglo-American, which is a, a major, major mining company. Anglo-American owns Anglo-Platinum which was probably the owner of the, the mine uh, in Rustenburg, which uh, uh, the bishop showed the photograph of. And uh, it's also the owner of De Beers operating in, in Botswana, which Dr. Tembo Moeti spoke about. Uh, the, the bishop said you can only understand statistics if you held the hand of uh, the individual who the, it represents. I have been in that area. I have held the hand of a, a man dying of AIDS with a very angry Anglo-American Dr. Brian Brink alongside me who'd been working on the subject for 10 years, sorry, 20 years, more than 20 years, uh, about the, the tragedy and unnecessary nature of it. Uh, those problems, and we saw the work of some of the, uh, the bishops, uh, I don't know whether it was the bishops, but but some of those tremendous ladies working on, uh, women working on palliative care, care. Those problems can only be addressed by corporations working with other parts of, of society. Back to the Global Compact. Kofi Annan's uh, speech, uh, when I listened to it, we were expecting, because uh, Robin Aram of Shell uh, had had some input into it, and we were expecting an item on corruption. And when I listened to the delivery, it had been in there, it had fallen out, and I was a bit disappointed. Uh, actually, I think Kofi Annan was, was right. It was a very brave step, the promulgating the Global Compact. He had no authority from the General Assembly. The 
uh, Secretary General is the servant of the General Assembly, and quite a number of people uh, complained that he had overstepped. Why had he suddenly started talking about business and brought business into the United Nations, and everyone knew that uh, business were bad news anyway. Uh, and he was able to defend himself from that by saying that the, the nine principles as they were all, were all based on, on UN conventions. And there wasn't at that time a, a convention on corruption. When I was asked if I'd join the advisory group, I did say that I'd only do so on one condition, that we work to put corruption in, because corruption, as we've heard, is absolutely fundamental to an underpinning many of the evils that, that we see. It took quite a while, and nothing to do with me, but a large amount of work by Peter Eigen in and Transparency International, and we persuaded the signatories to accept a tenth principle. We had to promise we wouldn't keep adding principles, so I'm sorry for those who think we might be able to keep adding them. I think it'll be very difficult, uh, but I think the ones we've got are, are, are good enough. Uh, the next step, uh, step was, as you've heard, the, uh, the concern that the, it was just words. And uh, we went through a rocky patch where people talked about blue wash uh, until we started uh, the, the requirement for putting, making communications on progress came in. And uh, we had to uh, uh, start delisting people. Uh, and that increased credibility enormously, just as it, I think, we heard from Philip Parham that uh, the UK... Uh, Department for International Development starting to stop funding certain organizations because they don't think they get any uh, worth out of it, I think is a hugely important uh, signal. Uh, whether they're right or wrong doesn't matter, but the fact that they're thinking about it and publicly announcing that they're not going to give money to UNIDO or UN Habitat or the ILO is extremely important. If you, what is it, I'm not going to go into all the aspects of the Global Compact because I hope that we can have some good time for, for discussion and, and interaction. Uh, but a, a, uh, a clear element, an absolutely fundamental, are how you embed the 10 principles in your, in your business. Uh, York Lunau, uh, and in the blueprint for uh, sustainable business, the, which the compact has produced, it suggests that we should add to that very much support of the UN goals, including uh, the Millennium Development Goals. And this has resulted in quite a bit of, of pushback from companies, because companies say, look, we've got these 10 commandments, we have to follow them, we believe in them, and now you want us to fix world poverty as well. And that's just you know, more than we can handle. Uh, it's not that we don't agree that it should be done, but, but, you know, we can't take on everything. And I think that is important because, as Jörg Luna said, we have actually to work on supporting those things which are in line with our core strengths and core business. Uh, but our core businesses cover most of those, as we heard from the businesses, cover most of those uh, uh, millennium Development Goals, whether you're in pharmaceuticals, beverages, uh, mining, uh, oil and gas, banking, uh, etc. You can find uh, areas, and I think that will be very important. It's also extremely important, and the biggest contribution that business around the world can make is actually to the development of economic activity. I'm sorry uh, for those who think that further economic activity will just cause more trouble. Uh, we are not going to solve the problems unless we have livelihoods and sustainable livelihoods in, in all of these uh, countries. And that's what we are extremely short of. And that will mean uh, people working, and companies certainly in the resource industry are working on that, looking at how in their neighborhood they can assist through investment, through loans, in creating businesses in their supply chain, but also outside their supply chain. 
And there's also been a big change in that over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. We used to concentrate on, in the communities around us, which were mainly very low-grade subsistence agriculture, on doing things which actually resulted in slightly higher grade, but still subsistence agriculture. That's important and, and a helpful palliative, but that's all it is. If we're going to feed all the people on the world, we will have to, I believe, change the agricultural systems. And that is difficult and dangerous because we know it's environmentally has issues, uh, but there are also problems of land tenure and, and rights. But I would say that Nestle, which gets an awful lot of stick, uh, has over the last 50 years done, we heard a little bit of it, uh, a remarkable job, I think, in assisting communities to industrialize, for example, milk production. Uh, and that's been a huge development opportunity for probably half a million farmers. I think that's the sort of thing that we are going to have to, uh, to do. Now, uh, I'm not going to spend time on, I'm going to, well, I'm not going to spend time on prime because we've talked a lot about that and it's absolutely fundamental to the compact. I'm not going to say very much about the principles for responsible investment, although I agree with whoever it was said that investors are the absolutely essential driver, more important than legislation. If your shareholders are interested in it, you pay attention to it. Legislation will take a long time in many countries to, to catch up. But to me, the most, uh, probably the most important element of the local, global compact are the local networks. Uh, we do not actually achieve anything by sitting in London or New York or Geneva and talking about these things, or even in Notre Dame. Uh, it, the actual action is done in countries, and it's done by and will be done, I believe, by coalitions of business, large business, the affiliates of international business, large local businesses. Someone said we need small businesses in, in, uh, in the global compact. The only way we'll get uh, small businesses in the global compact is through the local networks. We have to build the local networks because a small business can't participate in something thousands of miles away. So the local networks, these 90-something of them, are absolutely crucial to the furtherance of the goals of the Global Compact. Now, I always say to people, if you take, it used to be 60, and then it was 80, and now it's 90, whatever number, about, well, about a quarter of them are probably dying at the moment. I mean, local networks depend on local leadership and local drive. And that comes and goes, so an individual can change it and the network can go somewhat into abeyance. About another quarter of them are in statu nascendi, they're beginning to be, to, to be created. But about half of them actually do something, and we need to grow that and make sure that the 25% growing grow and that the 25% perishing are revitalized and resurrected. Uh, but what can a local network do? Well, an enormous number of things. Firstly, uh, if, if we talk about reviews of, uh, of communications on progress, we are dreaming if we think, and as, as chairman of the, the Global Compact Foundation, if we think we can raise the funds either from governments or, or private industry, in any foreseeable future to staff the kind of organization which means that the compact itself could review communications on progress uh, in New York, I think that's, that's pie in the sky. It's not gonna happen. And I'm not sure that it's even desirable. We have to force companies to put these communications out where they're open to scrutiny. If they lie in those, they will be found out. But Equally important in the local networks, when someone complains and says, ah, but you're not telling the truth, you can get them together with civil society, with their peer companies, and have a discussion, not a kangaroo court, but a discussion about whether this is, is 
really factual, and what are the issues and what are the mitigating circumstances and so on. So that sort of social reviewing in the company, in the country, is an important element. The other one is to look at the, the, the uh, uh, ten principles and say, in this country, what are the priorities? They're all important, but in some countries it'll be corruption. In some it'll be the environment, others human rights, labor conditions, and so on. And quite a lot, it's all of them. But even if it's all of them, which are the ones we can actually move to do something about together, collectively, now? And uh, I think if they can set those priorities and then work and help, help government, help talk about what legislation, local legislation, because we're not going to get global legislation, local legislation, how the enforcement of the legislation can be improved. That's really the exciting thing about local networks. I was recently in, in Dubai where they had a regional meeting of, of networks and uh, talking in the Gulf countries about what are, what are their priorities. And they very quickly came to, to say what the priorities were. Blindingly obvious, it's grossly inefficient use of energy, uh, which is subsidized and so on, right across the Middle East. But secondly, they all said migrant labor. It's conditions of work for migrant labor. Why do we need migrant labor? Should we not get citizens to do some of these jobs, the high unemployment, et cetera, et cetera? Very difficult subject, but absolutely right for priorities. I was in Bangladesh. Their two priorities were, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, migrant labor seen from the other end. Our people go away, the social impacts of that. And actually, they felt that one of their most important issues was the, the getting businesses to employ physically handicapped people uh, and what the benefits, and they had an initiative on what the benefits of that uh, uh, could be. If you take Sudan, which has been... Uh, mentioned. We had a meeting. Of, uh, there is a local network in Sudan. It was set up with quite a bit of, of controversy. I think it's extremely important. Uh, the Sudanese government was suspicious. They don't like anything with the United Nations uh, in. Uh, I mean, you, you, the UN symbol is popular in some countries. In some countries, not so far from here, it's not always very popular. Uh, and in Sudan, it's not popular. But nonetheless, when we explained to them what the, the compact did, they were accepting of it. And uh, in the Sudan network, we have in the global compact a working group on companies operating in conflict-sensitive zones. Uh, and what are the guidelines for such uh, companies? Uh, that was initiated partly by signatories to the Principles for Responsible Investment because they get stick from their investors for investing in companies who work in Sudan. And they said, what are we going to do about it? We don't understand it. So over a, a number of visits, we uh, set up a, a workshop in Sudan uh, in which uh, Six major investment funds participated. We got CNPC, who were mentioned, uh, to participate. CNPC uh, won't talk to individuals, individual investors. Well, they will sometimes. They won't talk, certainly won't talk to individual NGOs. But they were happy to sit in a meeting with NGOs and with investors and begin a process of engagement and they took those investors down to visit their oil operations, of which they are quite proud. Uh, and my, just as an anecdote, my wife and I were talking to the boss of CNPC. My wife has an interest in Sudan because there's a women's university in, in Sudan, which might surprise you, a very good women's university. It's been around for 100 years, uh, set up by a, a family, started as a school, he asked permission of the then British uh, administrators of Sudan whether he could do it, and uh, they, with great perception, turned him down twice and said, uh, educating women will only cause trouble. Uh, he, he persisted and, uh, and, and got permission, uh, and it's now a very good uh, university. The, uh, 
the, the boss of CNPC said, look, we've, we run this fantastic hospital, and it is a fantastic hospital which delivers remarkable services. We have a system which cleans up our, if you go on the internet, you see all sorts of complaints about uh, discharge water quality. He said, come and have a look, you know, the quality is outstanding. And he was highly indignant, and my wife started laughing, and he, he said, what's the matter? She said, uh, you sound just like my husband did 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> indignant because we were not understood. We felt we were doing a good job, but nobody understood us. Anyway, uh, there was progress, and government ministers of Sudan sat in that meeting, uh, two of them right through the meeting, and made constructive uh, comments. One, the Minister for International uh, uh, Engagement, who's, I think he's probably Christian, called Elias Diamel uh, Wakasan, told a story about going to a meeting with uh, President Omar Bashir. And uh, he said Bashir was at the beginning of the meeting, and then he walked out and said, Elias, you handle the meeting. And Elias said Bashir had just been indicted and the room fell on him, those who were against the indictment, those who were for, and the entire discussion of the meeting was, went into paralysis for a whole day. And at the end he said, I said to them, now listen, uh, I have actually, I am a member, a minister in a government of national unity arising from a, a comprehensive peace agreement. The, uh, under that peace agreement, before that peace agreement, I was an opponent. I fought Bashir. I'm now a minister in the government, and he's my president, and I support him. But, he said, you guys, he is carrying a basket of eggs, and if you folk carry on and keep jogging his elbow, he's going to drop the eggs, and they're going to be shattered eggs all over the place. Well, actually, in Sudan, thus far, the eggs are all in, in one piece. I'm not a fan of Bashir. If you go to Sudan, you see posters with Bashir, symbol of, of peace or unity, symbol of unity, I think, which causes you a certain <laughs> double take. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the compacts, local networks in these difficult areas is very important and is an area we have to uh, press ahead with. And uh, just as a final shot in that direction, Leela Kabasi, who was uh, talking yesterday, uh, uh, actually was in Iran talking to the Iranians about setting up a, uh, a local network. That'll be even more uh, controversial, and maybe it won't happen. But I think the most hopeful thing in the Global Compact is actually the local networks. Last thing. Uh, Sometimes people ask me, what do I think should be added to business schools' uh, curricula? And I don't actually say sustainable development, although I think it's very important. I think the most important thing we can teach business people going out into the world is to listen to people, to listen to people who they don't necessarily agree with, people who uh, they think probably don't know very much about their subject. I mean, in our businesses, we know a lot about them, they're complicated, and people come up with, with things which at first sight appear quite crazy ideas. But I think what we absolutely have to teach people to do is not only listen, but respond and engage and be prepared to sit down and talk to people because out of that come some very good ideas. So that's my last piece of advice and I look forward to our discussion on all the subjects of the uh, conference. Thanks very much. <laughs>